Um, so I think we can uh, get started. Um, thank you all for joining us, and uh, most of all, thank you to our uh, to our speakers today. Um, we are uh, looking at what I think is one of the areas that is starting to gain media traction and attention, but so far there hasn't been as much discussion uh, across the media about uh, the gendered nature of the conflict. Uh, as a scholar of uh, women, peace and security and uh, gender and international relations, I have been quite struck by the fact that uh, discussions of Security Council Resolution 1325, Women, Peace and Security, have been quite marginal uh, within the broader uh, debate and the broader discussion. Uh, so today we're having uh, today's round, round table to really reflect on those, those issues. So we started out with the question of where are the women and what work is gender doing, really inspired by Enlo's work. Um, so today I am joined by uh, four speakers, uh, Maria Dmitrieva, I hope I pronounced it correctly, um, who is currently in Kyiv and uh, in Ukraine, who will be uh, discussing her position, her reflections uh, from the ground um, and the impact of the war on women in Ukraine. Uh, she will be followed by Dr. Jenny Mathers from uh, Univer uh, Bariswith University, uh, who has uh, been working on issues to do with gender, militarization, uh, Russian uh, security. Um, we then will go turn to Catherine Wright, who has uh, whose whose work centers. Uh, around a discussion of NATO and women, peace and security. And finally, we, we will conclude with Dr. Graciela Piga, who has uh, just completed her PhD on the EU as a uh, gender equality actor in external affairs. Uh, and Ukraine was one of her case studies. Uh, as we were discussing prior to starting today's uh, webinar, she was in Kyiv uh, only a couple of years ago, and um, she will also be able to reflect on, uh, on her experience. So I'm gonna turn first to, to Maria. Uh, I, if you will, Give me one second to unmute Maria and um, and spotlight her video. Can you unmute? Excellent. And one second, Maria. So I'm going to spotlight your video and. Over to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, in case you are wondering, I am now safe, as anyone can be safe these days. Uh, the hostilities are to the north from here, about maybe 20 kilometers. Uh, so when you hear something loud uh, coming my way, uh, don't be uh, frightened. It is our artillery working with the Russian invaders. It is far from me. It is not going this way, at least for now. Uh, so um, I am Maria Dmitrieva. I live uh, in the southern uh, suburbs of Kyiv. I am a citizen of Ukraine. I am a radical feminist. And uh, I work in the organization called Democracy Development Center. Uh, we are promoting women's rights, we are promoting gender sensitive um, services, we are promoting understanding of international legal framework on women's rights and how it can be used for advocacy at the local level. And we have been working on uh, promoting the women peace security agenda since 2016 and about two years ago we started or maybe three, we started to work on promoting also youth peace security agenda. Uh, so I will uh, give you a short overview of what is going on uh, in Ukraine right now by major um, 
directions of uh, 1325. And then I will share some of my personal experiences to make this dry presentation not as dry. Uh, so as uh, we know, the two major directions of 1325 are women's participation and uh, uh, combating um, sexual violence and prevention of conflict. So. Uh, I have seen a lot of uh, questions why there are no women uh, taking part in the uh, peace negotiations going right now. Uh, the problem is that the negotiations that are going on right now are not the negotiations to reach any meaningful um, uh, any meaningful uh, peace agreement. Right now, they are uh, filling out the ground and uh, checking whether any side is uh, willing to cede. Uh, basically, uh, at the first meetings, Russians came with uh, demands that uh, pretty much uh, were equal to Ukraine totally surrendering, which is absolutely unacceptable. So, uh, and what we demand is that they leave us alone, they leave the occupied territories, and this is for now unacceptable to them. So, there is a hope that at the actual negotiations for peace, women will be presented at least at the Ukrainian side. As we know, Russia doesn't have even a national action plan on 1325. So we don't hold much hope for them uh, to engage women in the process. Uh, also, uh, we have a growing number of women participating uh, in the Ukrainian military, both on combatant and non-combatant positions. Uh, we now have about 20% of the uh, personnel in the security sector are women, which is one of the highest numbers in Europe, if not the highest. Uh, we have a significant number of women uh, joining our uh, territorial self-defense units. Uh, if you checked uh, foreign coverage of uh, this phenomenon, you may see it presented as a uh, desperate government is giving out weapons willy-nilly to anybody who shows up. No, it is a military uh, institution that is subordinated to the Ministry of Defense. It is organized iron run by the trained military and they accept people who either served, that is men, who uh, went through service in the army, or it is women who went through training on how to use uh, weapons uh, and how to fight. So nobody is giving uh, weapons to people, to, to randoms in the streets. Uh, we have a growing number of women working in the emergency services and uh, our um, healthcare system is pretty much like 85% women. So uh, women are represented in those areas and they are represented at the decision-making positions. Uh, we also have a very strong um, uh, effort by volunteers who uh, either help the war effort and these are also uh, mostly women. Uh, I would say like 60% women, 40% men. And we also have women helping other women who are either IDPs within Ukraine, or there are women who are helping Ukrainian women refugees uh, coming to other countries of Europe, to Northern America and uh, to the countries of Middle East. So they are supporting women, they are organizing, uh, immediate uh, uh, relief and support to those coming over. And uh, all this is done um, in a very organized, very thorough, uh, very respectful way. We also have uh, psychologists, mostly women, who uh, provide immediate uh, psychological uh, first aid to those who are finding it difficult to cope with everything that is going on. As to the other part, as to the sexual violence, I must admit uh, that uh, for the first time on my memory, I see that uh, both international, uh, national governmental institutions and NGOs are uh, open about sexual violence as a part of conflict. Uh, we already have several initiatives stemming from both our governmental high commissioner on gender equality and uh, from um, 
Ministry of Defense uh, and Ministry of Internal Affairs, uh, there are uh, initiatives to collect the data on sexual violence. Uh, this uh, information is publicized. It is not hushed. It is not uh, glossed over. Uh, it is said in direct words, there is going to happen. Uh, sexual violence is going to happen. We know this because this is what Russian military have been doing in other conflict zones. And uh, it is just a matter of time before this information surfaces. And uh, we are organizing trainings for local initiatives and local activists so that they know how to collect the data and how to preserve it and to whom to refer it so it is all uh, uh, collected together. And this information is going to be part of our international lawsuits against Russia and the Russian military. And it will be included into our lawsuits on uh, humanitarian crisis and war crimes committed by the Russian military. Uh, we are also, uh, we also know that there are initiatives within the Ukrainian army and in our security sector to stop sexual harassment by our military of women and uh, of Ukrainian military women by uh, their colleagues in the army. So these initiatives may not be on the forefront of the discussion right now, but they are in place. They are supported. Uh, people know about them. So uh, if, uh, if I am brief, this is the overview of what is going on. Uh, ah, yeah, the, the refugees. Uh, uh, as of today, the official number of refugees who left Ukraine since the beginning of the full-scale invasion uh, is more than two and a half million. And of them, more than a million are children. So uh, because Ukrainian men are not allowed by law to leave the war or the, the country in war, it, uh, <coughs> we can uh, assume that uh, most of people in those uh, two and a half million are women of different ages. <coughs> and uh, we already uh, have heard about cases of attempted abductions of young women uh, on the Ukrainian-Polish border and on uh, Polish-German border. Uh, we know, uh, we learned it from our German colleagues that uh, German uh, brothel owners and funders are already looking forward to young Ukrainian women coming to German brothels. We know that uh, in uh, other countries like in Hungary, uh, which is the capital, like Germany is uh, the brothel of Europe and Hungary is uh, the porn studio of Europe. We know that in Hungary, they are also looking forward to Ukrainians coming over. So uh, these are uh, we, we, so pornography, prostitution, and surrogacy. These are the three major dangers that are waiting for Ukrainian women refugees uh, leaving Ukraine. Uh, we know uh, about surrogacy because surrogacy clinics are now ramping up their advertising on Facebook. Ukraine is, uh, Ukrainian women are presented as vulnerable and uh, easy to obtain to commission a child. So uh, this is uh, another issue that is also overlooked uh, by the international media. If you check the materials on the topic, you will only see the uh, heart-wrenching stories of poor parents who want to hold their baby who is held up somewhere in a bomb shelter in Kiev. And nothing is said about the baby's actual mother who uh, gave this baby life uh, and she is left uh, to you know fend for herself and uh the surrogacy clinics do not allow women who carry commissioned babies to leave the country even if they need to go with their families so uh as we see the war uh and armed conflict puts women at more risk and uh it uh, makes it difficult for the state to protect women's rights and to promote women's rights and uh to mm, finish my presentation, I will share with you a 
story how I met this invasion. Uh, so we have been implementing a project on women, peace, security, and CEDO for uh, uh, different oblasts of Ukraine. And we had one event planned. It was supposed to be for young women peace builders. We planned it for November, but because of COVID, it kept uh, being pushed and pushed to a later date. So we ended up to, uh, with the date uh, of it being February 24. It was supposed to be a three-day event. It was supposed to uh, bring together 40 young women from all over the country. And uh, on the morning of February 24th, uh, my brother called me at 6 a.m. and told me that the war, uh, the invasion began. And he told me that I better stay at home. But I already knew that these young women are coming. And uh, I was not in a position to leave them alone, just tell them, you know, go away. Uh, so I picked up my computer and I went to downtown Kyiv. And uh, we started this training with half the people that we planned for. <coughs> and uh, it was, uh, one, I would say, the most difficult training I had in my life. Because all the time they were calling their relatives, they were calling their parents. We had uh, air raid uh, sirens going off every two hours. So uh, by the next day, there were 15 of them. So five of them left during the first day. Uh, and so I stayed with them at the hotel uh, because uh, if I went back home, it would be difficult for me to get back to this hotel for the second date. So on the second day, uh, we worked with them uh, till 4 p.m. And after that, they said we are unable to concentrate on what we are saying. We were discussing, you know, uh, uh, how women peace security relates to uh, human security, how it all is reflected in CEDO and in Beijing Platform for Action, how these documents can be applied to their local communities. But uh, we also talked about uh, transitional justice and other topics. And I really hope what we discussed with them will be useful for them in the long run. But uh, we ended up uh, ending it uh, one day short. And uh, my husband called me and tell, told me, come back home before uh, they stop all the transportation. So after the last uh, air raid siren, I uh, left those girls there at the hotel and they were given uh, guarantees that they can stay there as long as they need because half of those who left were from Kherson. As you know, Kherson is now under uh, siege. Russians are trying to take over it and we in good conscience uh, would not be able to let them go. So they stayed at the hotel. Uh, two girls uh, from the train are still at the hotel. They refuse to leave. They don't want to go to Sweden or to Germany uh, as we offered them. But uh, I really hope that they will, they are also from Kherson. I, I really hope that they will find a place that they can stay till the war is over and Kherson is freed. So this is how I met this uh, invasion. And ever since all I'm doing is sitting at home and giving interviews. I will be happy to answer any questions that you have for me. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Maria. Um, that's uh, really, thank you for summarizing your, your experience and the work that you, uh, you're doing and um, giving us some insights into the conditions in, uh, in Ukraine. We're gonna turn to uh, Jenny uh, now and I'm going to spotlight your video uh, if I can. Brilliant. Over to you, Jenny. Okay, great. Thank you very much, um, and thank you, Maria. That was such a powerful, uh, such a powerful statement. Um, so, what I want to do is say a little bit about um, sort of gender divisions of labor uh, within this conflict um, so far, and I want to start with quite a stark um, contrast, and and then make it a little bit more nuanced um, as we go on. So, certainly, from I mean, I would I would start by saying that that this is definitely a conflict where the whole of Ukrainian society is participating and people are doing all kinds of things uh, within the, the scope of their abilities and within the, the possibilities that are, that are open to them. So I would definitely want to acknowledge that. 
having acknowledged that though, I would say that that you know, overwhelmingly what we're seeing is a very dominant, um, sharp gender divide, all right? Overwhelmingly, it is, you know, the men who are being seen as, uh, as the fighters. Um, and what we see from the men um, that, are, that are fighting, you know, we see that, you know, the men are not allowed to, to leave the country. Um, we see that, that they are, you know, sort of putting on uniform, either joining the army or they're part of these sort of territorial um, uh, local defense um, organizations. Um, but we see them very much, you know, they're, they're very active. They're, they're definitely agents. Um, we see them in these sort of grainy videos, ambushing uh, Russian columns of, of trucks and, and tanks and so on. Uh, you know, we see them where they're very active. Um, we see them as heroes and sometimes as, as martyrs, uh, even uh, when, when sadly uh, some of them are, are killed or, or injured. Um, we see them as governing, we see men governing and the politics at the highest level in Ukraine is um, very male dominated. I mean, Zelensky's cabinet currently only has one woman in it, um, and which is a real a real contrast between his first cabinet, which had I think six women. Um, so even the 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 business of the everyday business of governing um, at at the highest level um, is is very male dominated. What we see the women doing overwhelmingly is um, you know a lot of grassroots organizing. Um, a lot of, of sort of caring and nurturing of the families who are left behind, of the vulnerable people who are um, st either still in Ukraine, in Ukraine, I should say, um, or those who've left either to, to other parts of, of the country or have, have gone abroad. Um, and as Maria pointed out, the, the refugee experience is overwhelmingly a woman's experience. It's very gendered. Um, it is, you know, very often the, the woman and her children, if she's a, a mother or the woman and her, perhaps her, her parents or her extended family, um, you know, leaving the country and leaving the men behind to fight. Um, so it's, it's very, very stark. Um, we also see women um, providing a lot of the, um, the support that's necessary for the men who are fighting. So we see women um, coming together to make camouflage nets. We've seen quite a lot of that recently. Um, um, and we see women, you know, collecting uh, materials uh, to support either, you know, local civilian populations or to support uh, the armed forces. And this kind of a grassroots organizing, uh, often led by women, is something which actually has been happening for the last eight years. Um, and one of the things that was most striking about the, the war in the Donbass, especially the first few years, was the extent to which it was uh, supported by civilian society. Um, and, you know, the number of, of uh, NGOs that sprang up and that were, you know, seeking uh, donations and collecting goods and buying goods for the army and, you know, actually putting them into trucks and, and vans and private vehicles and taking them to the front lines, uh, distributing them was, was very, very striking. And it's, it, it demonstrates the real, the, the strength and the depth of civil society in Ukraine. And a lot of these um, initiatives were, were women's initiatives or, or sort of female dominated um, initiatives very much so. I want to say something about the, the, the experience of women soldiers. And that's, that's where some of the nuance comes in because you've got this very stark divide between, you know, the men are fighting uh, the enemy and the women are kind of supporting uh, from the behind the scenes and, and organizing behind the scenes and, and supporting the families and fleeing. Um, but, but kind of making that picture a little bit more complicated is the fact that um, we've got women soldiers increasingly uh, involved. And it's interesting, very, very interesting for me as somebody who's been interested in women soldiers for a long time and, and started out by looking at women soldiers in, in, in Russia, is that the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense has gone through a real trajectory of uh, its attitudes towards women soldiers. And when the, when the war in the Donbass started back in 2014, it seemed quite ambivalent about women and, and quite reluctant in some ways to see them in fighting roles. And it took quite a long time for um, the, the Ministry of Defense to want to recruit women actively um, and to want to see them in those kinds of roles. And there was a, a lengthy period really where women were fighting uh, in combat roles, but it wasn't acknowledged. And so they had to go you know, officially as seamstresses or cooks or, or something of that nature, um, but actually they, they were you know, playing a full role in, in combat. Um, now that has, has changed, those rules have changed, those roles are opened up to women, women are openly um, serving in combat roles. 
And as Maria pointed out, the, the proportion of women as well as the number is, has really sharply gone up. And, and the latest figure I had seen um, was not as high as the one that Maria gave, but you know, 20% is extraordinarily high uh, in Europe. And I suspect it probably is the highest um, in terms of proportion of women in, in the European state military. Um, and so that's, that's really interesting. The, I think there's still though, a certain amount of ambivalence about, um, about women soldiers. And, and in the, the period of the, the eight years when, when the war was confined really to, to Eastern Ukraine, um, my impression, and I'm happy to be corrected, but my impression was that certainly at the highest levels of, uh, of sort of government and, and Ministry of Defense, um, there was a lot of, of eagerness to, to push the idea that women were a full part of the Ukrainian military. And there was a real emphasis on, you know, putting women's pictures on glossy publications, especially ones in English that were obviously aimed at wider audiences beyond Ukraine. And a lot of emphasis on um, demonstrating, especially I think to NATO, uh, but also perhaps to the EU, that gender equality is something that Ukraine was supporting and supporting at the highest levels. And you can see it because look, there are women fighting in, in the armed forces. Um, so I think there was this element of performance, I'm not saying that the women didn't do substantive jobs, um, but there was this element at the highest levels of presenting them and that, that you know, having them there was, was serving political purposes and diplomatic purposes as well as the, the everyday practical purposes. So what's happening now with the, with the women soldiers I think is also very interesting because Although I, you know, can see, um, you know, evidence that they're obviously doing substantive roles and they're they're making a, a big difference and making a huge contribution, the impression that one gets through certainly through social media, um, you know, sitting and consuming it outside of Ukraine and watching, you know, the various, um, you know, Ukrainian accounts, but also foreign journalists who are there who are covering the war in various ways. Um, it, it seems quite tokenistic the way that women soldiers are being presented in a lot of cases. I mean, either you see very stylized images of them, which are obviously taken before the current war, because I'm sure nobody has time to take the pretty pictures at the moment. Um, you see quite stylized images of them. Um, you see pictures of women signing up, um, you know, to, to join in. You see pictures of women being trained. Um, you see uh, images of women getting married. Um, on the front lines, you know, uh, couples getting getting married on, on the front lines, sometimes people who obviously met very, very, very recently. Um, not so much. And, and of course, occasionally, um, sadly, you know, you see the, the sort of um, memorial kind of pictures and, and, and postings that, you know, this, this woman was, was killed in action. Um, but we're not seeing so much of, of the, the women doing the everyday job. And I don't know whether this is because of the nature of the work that they're doing um, is such that it's not getting captured uh, in quite the same way. Um, but when we see, you know, those teams of, uh, of soldiers kind of ambushing, uh, you know, Russian vehicles and so on, if we see, when we see soldiers in action, I, I'm always looking to see, are there any women there? And, I'm, and I, I never, I haven't so far seen them. So again, I'm happy to be pointed to, to sources that I'm not looking at, which, which would make them more visible. So I think that the picture that we're seeing is a complicated one in terms of gender division of labor. At first glance, it looks quite straightforward uh, that we can see men doing certain things, women doing other things. But then when we look at it more closely, it becomes a bit more nuanced, it becomes a bit more, um, more permeable um, and those lines are definitely being crossed. Um, now, my question is, and I don't have the answer to it, but my, the question that I keep asking myself is, so is this going to translate into something in the longer term, which is really acknowledging um, the, the different roles that women have, are playing, but also, you know, is this going to translate into something really meaningful in terms of a post-conflict order? You know, is there going to be more gender equality in a post-conflict Ukraine? as a result of what has happened during the war. And sometimes we've seen that happening after wars, but very often, you know, if you look at historical examples, very often it doesn't happen necessarily uh, in quite the way that we might hope. So that's kind of where I'm gonna leave things uh, for now and hand back to Roberta. Jenny, thank you so much uh, for the contextualization as well. Um, Catherine, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and then I'm going to uh, spotlight you. Over to you, Catherine. You can't unmute, okay. Uh, give me one second. 
you should. I'm unsilenced. Thank you. Sorry, Catherine. <laughs> That's okay. Um, and thank you, um, Maria, for, for your insights and, and also um, Jenny. So I'm going to focus, as Roberta said, on, on kind of NATO's response and the relevance of gender there. So I've been researching NATO and women, peace and security for over a decade now. Um, I've looked at NATO in terms of how it functions as an international institution of hegemonic masculinity, the politics of the adoption of WPS at NATO, NATO's digital diplomacy and strategic communications, and also kind of relevant here in particular, how WPS has been utilised in NATO partnerships with non-members, and that includes Ukraine, um, but also relevant here, um, how NATO has used WPS to build bridges with civil society, which is new for NATO and for many civil society. And that work has never seemed more relevant than now, yet WPS has been noticeable by its absence from NATO's response to the war. So the Russian invasion of Ukraine, as we know, has challenged the accepted international order. In terms of NATO, it's the first deployment of the NATO response force under the remit of collective defense. So that's the Article 5 commitment. It has also raised questions about the future of WPS. Um, and WPS, if we think it calls for the better representation of women in peace and security, but also for the acknowledgement of the gendered impact of armed conflicts on all genders, is therefore highly applicable to understanding and responding to the current conflict. Yet the agenda, its principles and its aspirations have been noticeable by their absence from NATO and the West, so NATO member states, response to the war. And that's in spite of numeral, numerous policy commitments by NATO, its members and partners. So while there's a lot we don't know about NATO's reaction, we would expect that NATO would have articulated the relevance of agenda perspective publicly if it were implementing WPS in, in how it's formulating its response. So a case in point here is International Women's Day, which fell last week, um, just two weeks after the Russian invasion, and at a time that NATO usually uses to showcase its work on WPS. So the main NATO Twitter account remained fairly quiet on International Women's Day, and usually it's, it's retweeting other NATO accounts um, and it, it didn't actually retweet any accounts which made the link between WPS and its relevance to the situation in Ukraine. So that includes the NATO Special Representative on Women, Peace and Security who tweeted about the link um, and also the Dutch delegation to NATO who also tweeted. So it's interesting that there's kind of this, this silence there in, in NATO's kind of mainstream narrative. We might also have expected WPS to be at the forefront of NATO. And when I talk about NATO here, I'm talking about its members and its partners and their response to Russia's intervention, given NATO's partnership with Ukraine has been forged through the WPS agenda. So we know the NATO liaison office in Kiev has supported the development of Ukraine's own national action plan. And NATO Science for Peace program has also targeted funding at projects focused specifically on WPS in Ukraine. So it's been a key driver here. Nevertheless, the focus of such intervention by NATO has significantly narrowed the WPS agenda and it's focused predominantly on the recruitment of women into Ukraine's armed forces. So this is something I think I saw Mila O'Sullivan in, correct me if I'm wrong, in the audience, um, and this is something that her work focusing on Ukraine and WPS has also highlighted. And this militarised approach to the WPS agenda, which is the approach that NATO takes, may help us explain why WPS is absent from NATO's response now. The other thing worth noting is that Ukraine are actually a signatory to NATO's own policy and action plan on women, peace and security, which is adopted in conjunction with the Euro-Atlantic Partnership Council and 28 other partner states. So the most recent so 2018 revision of this policy makes it clear that NATO aims to address gender inequality and integrate WPS through the alliance's core tasks. And that member states, and that includes collective defense, 
but member states have the primary responsibility in respect to collective defence to ensure the provision of trained troops and experts on gender issues, as well as a better gender balance in NATO-led forces. So there's been no claim that gender advisors are being deployed as part of the NATO response force by NATO or those contributing to this operation. So actually deploying gender advisors has been a huge problem as my research has shown and getting nations to commit to doing that. So it's perhaps no surprise that we're seeing that issue now. And I think we would expect NATO to be talking about them if they were there, because it usually does. Um, more broadly, NATO's strategic communications and digital diplomacy have become a critical site to respond to Russian misinformation, but they also give an insight into the alliance's priorities, both in terms of what it foregrounds, but also in terms of how it foregrounds it. Now, the value of a gender perspective here is crucial for understanding just who NATO's public diplomacy reaches. And NATO has made or had made very significant inroads in recent years into challenging what was a very gendered reception of its communications in recent years. Um, yet we see a, a return to a narrative of NATO as a muscular military power with far less attention paid to the human stories underpinning the war, particularly the voices of Ukrainian women or attempts to reach beyond the usual suspects concerned with NATO. Um, so in, in recent years, NATO has managed to kind of transform its strategic communications so that it reaches women in its digital diplomacy efforts. Um, and I suspect that we're going to see significant kind of back steps there in terms of who is engaging with NATO's endless tweets of, of kind of tanks and aircraft carriers and things like that. So it's a very different digital representation. So the silences here that I'm highlighting, I would argue are also surprising given NATO has its own in-house expertise on WPS through the Special Representative on Women, Peace and Security. This is a high level position established to advise the Secretary General and NATO leadership. It seems likely given the fact that WPS has not appeared in any of the Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg's briefing following the numerous extraordinary meetings at NATO, which have also been had participation from partners, including Finland, Sweden and the EU. And these meetings have been held at the heads at the level of heads of state and government, foreign minister and chief of defence, um, that given the absence of kind of gender in the, the, the kind of summary of the meeting from the Secretary General, I think we could possibly gather from that that this established expertise is not being utilised by NATO leaders in the way that it should be. So I suggest that as a minimum space should be provided at these high level meetings for the special representative to provide a briefing on WPS concerns, but even better if a gender impact assessment was undertaken before the agreement of actions by allies or no actions. So NATO also has um, the tools at its disposal to utilise women, peace and security to support a more inclusive response to the war and Russia's actions. For example, it has a civil society advisory panel on WPS, which it established in 2014. And this provides a space for discussion with civil society based in member states, those on the receiving end of NATO operations, so it had representation from Afghanistan, and also kind of partner states, so that includes representation from civil society in Ukraine. And it's provided a platform for NATO to build and develop relationships with civil society, many of whom have been wary of engagement with the alliance due to perceptions about its purpose as a political military alliance. It's therefore a really important consultative mechanism through which NATO could be reaching out to Ukrainian civil society to ensure the voices of Ukrainian women are heard. There are also repercussions, I would argue, for not doing this for the alliance, um, such as the risk of perpetuating a perception that this advisory panel exists solely in an instrumental capacity to legitimise NATO's WPS work. So just to conclude, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, and he's not shy of making these statements. So in 2019, he stated that gender equality is an integral part of all NATO policies, programs and projects. 
Yeah, I argue that the response by NATO to the war in Ukraine, um, not just by NATO, but by its members and partners, many of whom have championed women, peace and security, draws attention to what many feminists have feared, and that is the disjuncture between the rhetoric and the reality of the global commitment to the WPS agenda. This is despite the fact that NATO has the demonstrable ability and expertise to fully integrate and utilize WPS. NATO silence on WPS in Ukraine risks undermining its wider work on the agenda and puts at risk the possibility of a lasting and inclusive peace reflective of the whole of Ukrainian society. It also calls attention to the limits of a militarized understanding of WPS, such as that championed by NATO. And this very much, I argue, places the agenda in jeopardy of being instrumentalized and ultimately reduced to redundancy. Thank you. Catherine, thank you so much. That was um, really interesting. Um, Graziella, we're gonna come over to you and I'm... There you go, over to you, Graziella. Okay, um, so I need to share my screen. I will just a small presentation. Um, you should uh, give me the authorization, Roberta, to share the screen. Can you see it? Okay, sorry. It's too big. Still too big. Sorry, I'm sure it's. Can you see it all? Yeah, so I do. Um, okay, so good uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, so um, I will talk, um, I don't know, this presentation is a mix of practitioner work and a bit of my research um, uh, for my PhD. As uh, Roberta mentioned before, I did, I just finished my PhD research on the uh, general dimension of the EU foreign and security policy, and I looked specifically at the implementation of the uh, EU WPS agenda in Ukraine. And I was there two years ago um, to interview, I was there in January, February 2020, to interview EU staff, international organizations, and civil society organization and academia. And obviously, I could never imagine that we'll be here today talking about the, the war and the invasion of, invasion of Russia in Ukraine territory. Um, so in my field research, um, I investigated one of the things that I investigated was the, the role of actors, but also their vision of uh, security, uh, which uh, influenced the implementation of WPS agenda. And uh, from the analysis of the interview, um, I just want to show you a few things. Um, three main themes emerged. And the first one was um, something that also um, Mila O'Sullivan, who is here, I know, I read her article, talked, it was the uh, securitization of WPS agenda. Um, in fact, there was a very strong focus on security sector reform uh, also in the work of the EU. And, uh, and there was a tension among civil society organizations. In fact, uh, um, among those that I had interviewed, there were clearly two different uh, groups. One group that was um, uh, that thought that was really important to focus on uh, gender representation in the army and supporting women veterans' rights. And this was identified as a key solution, whereas others uh, thought that uh, it was really important uh, to work on uh, uh, mediation across the conflict lines. And um, the second, in fact, the second uh, main point that came out from these interviews was that uh, there was too little talk about peace and too much about war. In fact, uh, um, uh, it seemed that uh, there was very little uh, programmatic uh, work uh, from the side of the EU on, uh, on women, people and security on the peace part of the women peace and security agenda and there were very few um, organizations that were funded by actually not by the eu directly but uh, by eu member states um, that were working on our programs ac across the conflict uh, divide and uh, and they were doing work uh, on uh, on dialogue and um, and peace building and um, there was this was um, the the 
this was a, a sentence that um, one of the peace activists that um, uh, has been in Ukraine until a few weeks ago, now I know she fled the country, told me. So she told me in the last five years, we talked a lot about women and gender and security, mostly from the state point of view. And the word peace has kind of been taboo because of the main rhetoric is we are attacked by the neighboring state. We are at war and our strategy should be victory. And now within this sentence, I think actually now you are at war and you are attacked by the neighboring states. And I know, uh, you know, uh, this is the, the common feeling. So I feel really, you know, weird reading the sentence. Uh, at the same time, uh, um, it is interesting uh, um, that, uh, you know, uh, there was so much focus on all this sector reform at the time when it was possible to do it. The third point uh, uh, that emerged was really this missing link and the limited vision of WPS agenda. And I'm always talking about the, the EU work in, uh, in Ukraine. Um, in fact, the, as I said, there was much support uh, from the CSDP missions, uh, which is an advisory mission uh, to the work of the, of the different ministry on security sector reform, but very little and uh, mainly through the um, through UN women on other parts of the security uh, of the women, peace and security agenda. And um, uh, namely, um, you know, they work on uh, social cohesion, the role of women in relief and recovery in the Donbass area. Um, following, uh, um, as I said, I defended my thesis just like the day before the, the war started. And uh, so the day after, you know, I am, I really, since the beginning of this uh, Russian invasion, I've, I've been following the social media and, um, and the feminist activists that I know. And um, I was, um, I, I thought it was interesting um, that uh, a lot of the, the posts, there were so many posts that actually confirm a bit to this uh, militarization of the WPS agenda. And, uh, you know, people before me have talked uh, a lot about uh, the role of women in the, in the army and the fact that uh, women are combatant. But uh, I found it uh, peculiar that on the 8th of March, there were so many posts that were talking about women's participation in the army, which is something that we have not seen before. And um, this post, I mean, I, I can't read the, the, the Ukrainian version and then and because I'm based in French, it comes automatically the French translation. But basically, one of the most important points is say that on the 7th of, oh, sorry, on the 8th of March, uh, 7,000 women were not uh, met with flowers on the 8th of March, but with arms in their hands. Uh, and they will fight uh, uh, next to the men uh, against the, the fight, the, the Russian aggressor. And that they will fight for the future um, of the of Ukraine and um, I thought it was uh, I think this is um, tells us a lot uh, where you know which direction uh, the WPS agenda actually is going in Ukraine and this is another uh, post about uh, um, that uh, I found uh, and I know Maria you know all these posts because they are all in the groups uh, that um, you visit and that I visit um, this says I mean to be a woman in Ukraine and again I mean shows us like uh, the role of women and here we have a women combatant, but also women in the house, women that uh, think about the food, and then women that bring food to the front. I could not open this now. But I, I think it's really interesting to see, you know, this mobilization. So we see the woman is not just sitting at home, but actually has these multiple roles. And so we, we see how, you know, the, the WPS agenda is represented just in these uh, pictures. And um, there is also this post that I would like to share with you. This is uh, from the President Advisor Arestovich. Um, and here we see, you know, uh, he talks uh, about uh, of women as symbol of power, combatant, aids, and carer. So actually, you know, brings together, you know, the different roles that women have in the Ukrainian society at the moment. Um, Another thing that uh, Maria has mentioned, and I think is really important, I didn't put a picture here because um, this refers to, you know, that part of the women, peace and security agenda that refers to prevention and protection. And we have seen, I think, thousands of videos and pictures uh, in the last uh, 19 days uh, that uh, portray refugee women and girls, uh, and, um, and we see all of them fleeing. And uh, also the, um, I, um, 
um, somebody before me mentioned about uh, you know this uh, this role that uh, women have um, at the moment that uh, you know is different. There is a separation, but at the same time we see women fly, uh, fleeing the country, and then we see you know the men staying. But actually, there are also a lot of women combatants staying. But the overwhelming majority of uh, people fleeing the country are actually women and girls. And uh, I saw there are several posts, you know, Maria was mentioning this about the vulnerability of these women, the, the heightened risk to become, uh, to fall prey of uh, human traffickers. And um, there are also several posts that talk about, you know, you know, about safe transportation. We know that a lot of women are, you know, taking, especially in the they were taking a, a lot of um, private transport to to reach the 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 border with Poland and um, or with Romania. And I know personally people that fled and they were you know they were all discussing among each other how to reach the border. So there there is this uh, issue of really vulnerability and risk. And uh, we know with whom can you travel safely? And even when you arrive in the EU, are you actually safe because you don't know actually where you are ending you are ending up? And, um, and then uh, last but not least, uh, women's rights activists. Uh, I spoke personally, I mean, we have here Maria and I spoke to another group of women uh, that uh, were under the bomb when we were talking. And um, so these women, uh, several of them decided to remain there in Ukraine to provide support. Uh, and uh, you know they're risking their lives, but who is actually protecting them? You know uh, which measures are actually in place to 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 support and to protect these women's rights activists that have decided to stay in the country, not to flee. And especially, I'm, I actually I was in you know I was in touch through a friend that uh, works there with women that were both in Donbass and um, and uh, in the government control government. I don't know anymore if I can call them government control territories at the moment. Um, and uh, they all were facing the same uh, struggles and they all faced the same risks. And uh, so if you think about the, the women peace and security agenda, we have to think also what is in place at the moment, you know, to, to protect these women and uh, what is waiting for us. Um, the other uh, pillar um, of the women peace and security agenda, you know, um, you know, peacemaking. Of course, as Maria said, it's too early to talk about peacemaking. However, I was um, kind of puzzled by the fact that I saw only one post of women calling for peace, and maybe, you know, I, I overlooked others. And this post was uh, from Yulia Harashvili, who is actually um, a prominent uh, um, activist from Georgia. She was, uh, she's a refugee herself from Abkhazia. She flew Abkhazia when a Russian um, invaded Abkhazia. And um, and she's very active. She's uh, you know in the High Council of the uh, uh, UN Women. Uh, um, uh, uh, how is it was called the uh, High Council for on Women, Peace, and Security that we, UN Women had established. Um, I thought it was interesting that this call was done was made by American and Russian women. Uh, but at the same time, another thing that uh, I found interesting, it was how women were actually portrayed and it was actually we are mothers, daughters, grandmothers, and we are sister one to another, which is, um, you know, one of the, um, you know, the ways that uh, women always try to, to make, you know, to, to bring, you know, their interests together. But in a sense, also, there is uh, essentialized, I mean, women's roles and um, in the society. And uh, Last, uh, thinking about what um, uh, Roberta was talking about, silences. Uh, um, Maria, you know this letter. Uh, this is a letter that um, was written in response uh, to a, a congratulat congratulatory letter of uh, the regional director of UN Women uh, on the 8th of March. And uh, this is the response of the government commissioner for gender equality who actually was uh, very surprised to say the least that there wasn't any mention of the situation in Ukraine. And I have to say, I'm surprised myself. Um, so um, silence is because uh, it is interesting that, uh, you know, and the same thing has, for example, uh, um, uh, Catherine was mentioning before, you know, that uh, NATO didn't have this tweet on the 8th of March. Here there was a tweet but actually without any reference to the Ukrainian situation and the regional office is covering Ukraine, has an office in Ukraine. 
And it's very peculiar that there was this choice not to even mention the conflict, uh, not to even make a reference to the women peace and security agenda and, uh, you know, and the role of women on the 8th of March. Um, here talking about silences. It's not about uh, the EU, but it's about still uh, big actors that are also working in, in cooperation with the EU and they also have most, they are mostly funded by the EU in their programs. And um, this uh, last bit I want to focus on is about uh, really the EU silences and um, on WPS and uh, on, you know, in, in WPS and Ukraine uh, conflict uh, for the first 12 days. Basically for the first 12 days, uh, there wasn't any mention on, you know, WPS and Ukraine uh, from the, um, from the um, um, EU external action office. Uh, only on the 8th of March, we see the post of um, the high representative um, Joseph Borrell, where he talks about uh, women, you know, the role that uh, women pay and, and the price that they pay uh, for wars. And, um, and he talks about Putin's aggression. So it's quite an open uh, you know, um, um, uh, tweet, but uh, still there was silence for 12 days. And uh, as many of you uh, know for sure, um, perhaps, I don't know, um, the EU has, um, has had already two um, um, strategies on WPS, one that was adopted in 2008, and the second one was adopted in 2018. Um, at the same time, there was uh, um, in 2015, uh, there was the appointment of the principal advisor on gender and WPS, uh, who um, uh, has been replaced only last year after eight months of vacant work, uh, position. And uh, the new um, uh, person that has replaced the advisor has now changed her name. Her name is um, Ambassador, her title, I mean, Ambassador on Gender and Diversity. Also, she was uh, she, she should be playing a big role in this situation, but also, you know, she was pretty silent until the 8th of March. So this is uh, her tweet with a video message. And, you know, it's the first one that refers to WPS and Ukraine since the war started. And this is interesting if we think that the EU, um, you know, wants to be a gender actor, has this stra comprehensive strategy on the implementation of WPS agenda. And now has also adopted, you know, the Gender Action Plan 3, which brings together WPS agenda and the Gender Action Plan. And yet uh, it took them, again, you know, so many days to make uh, a reference to the, to the war, to, to the WPS agenda and the role of women in Ukraine. Uh, a bit better, perhaps, was with uh, Roberta Mezzola from Malta, I mean, uh, the, um, uh, the president of the parliament. Uh, she actually makes uh, uh, a direct uh, tweet, but again, all on the 8th of March. And here, these are a series of tweets that, um, you know, we have seen for the 8th of March, and uh, but much silence before. And the interesting thing about uh, also the, the ambassador, which, who should be having a primary role that uh, she's actually retweeting other people's uh, uh, tweets, but um, instead of having her own tweets on, uh, on, the, on the situation in Ukraine. Um, so this in a sense basically confirms uh, also what my research has shown that uh, the EU uh, basically is not that gender actor that uh, would like to, you know, that, to be portrayed, but uh, he's, um, yeah, it's basically taking a passenger seat and um, yeah, I will finish here.